So I was in uh, Kathmandu during the earthquake. I was, uh, it was Saturday uh, holiday. I was on my third floor of my building. Suddenly it started uh, shaking the building and we knew that it's an earthquake. And then, my God, I was just thinking that, uh, let it stop after some time because I knew that uh, my building, my house will not stand if it is too long earthquake and too strong earthquake. I was just praying that let it stop now, now, now. The earthquake is, is related to the process of mountain building in the Himalaya. As you know, India is moving north at a rate of about four centimeters per year and is colliding into Eurasia and that has formed the Himalayan range. The fault is not sliding gradually with time. Actually, it's locked. At the surface, it's locked. Stress is building up, but at some point, it unlocks. And this is what happened during the earthquake. Let's say around 10 years before, it was well accepted in the country that, you know, yes, we are heading towards a big earthquake, and a lot of activities was going on, and uh, that paid uh, uh, really to a great extent during the rescue relief operations, you know. Search and rescue part was uh, one of the excellently managed by the government, by the related organizations in Nepal. That was wonderful, and everyone appreciated it internationally. But then, when it came to the relief part, that was a big mess. It's a mountainous country. When you have large earthquakes, it is, it is the landslides that is the most scary thing in the villages. There was a huge, you know, it was a huge cry from the villagers, send us uh, geologists, engineers, whether we can live in this village or not. And uh, many of the villages uh, had to be evacuated and brought to a new safer place. One of the untold important stories about the Nepal earthquake is that the earthquake occurred on a Saturday when school was not in session. 6,000 schools collapsed. Something like a hundred, uh, uh, something like a million kids would have been in those schools. 300 schools that have been retrofit over the last 20 years all performed well, did not collapse. So we know and the Nepali um, engineers know how to retrofit schools and make them stronger. If you can get the village, a village in, involved in strengthening the, the, its school, they start learning about what, where do earthquakes come from, the fact that they repeat. The local masons learn how to make the school safer. And then the villagers want to incorporate and hire the masons to do the same thing in their homes. The thing that we realize is that this earthquake is a small earthquake actually by Himalayan standard. It didn't go all the way to the front of the mountain range. It's only the, the deeper part of the lock zone that, that ruptured. And, and from our measurements we have image where the fort is locked. It's a huge area. So uh, it could have been far worse. The movement along the fault, it did not rupture to the surface and it is stuck. So the energy is stored in the front of the mountain. Now we have about 25 new GPS stations. Some are permanent, some are temporary GPS stations are already installed immediately within a few weeks of time. The question is, if it slowly creeps, it will be very nice that you know the energy will be slowly dissipated. If it is just stuck and if it is not moving at all, that means the energy is still there and then one day it has to move and then produce that big earthquake. Nepal doesn't have enough uh, seismologists. We have hardly, you know, you can just uh, count on the fingers, three or four seismologists, qualified seismologists. We need many, many more. Something like a million kids now don't have a really good place to be educated. This is a, a tremendous blow to the future of Nepal. Skilled scientists and engineers are necessary just to augment the Nepali manpower to rebuild quickly.